My name is Jane Lesneski. I'm one of the freshman counselors in the undergraduate programs office of the college. We have a team of three freshman counselors who work with all incoming engineering students on adjusting to college life at Boston University. First and foremost, congratulations. Congratulations to each student here on his or her acceptance to Boston University. I'll give you a round of applause because it's a really impressive. The college admission process is no easy task and often a family adventure. We know that usually it involves every single member of the family. You all deserve to be very proud of this accomplishment. I do have a quick housekeeping note. If you have a meeting to meet with a representative of the Office of Financial Assistance, those meetings will take place in room 230. Feel free to leave the program a few minutes before your appointment time. I now have the pleasure of introducing the Dean of the College of Engineering, Dr. Ken Luchin. And I just have a few important snippets. I'm not sure what that banging is, but we'll find out. And maybe it's just their way of applauding you, Ken, you know, that banging in the back. We'll find out. <gasps> Dr. Luchin received his, M he received his BS in engineering science from the University of Virginia and his MS and PhD in biomedical engineering from Case Western Reserve University. Dean Luchin is one of the world's leading biomedical engineers he has published over 125 peer-reviewed journal articles related to lung structure and function. Dean Luchin was the chair of the Biomedical Engineering Department from 1998 to 2006. During that time, the department received a $14 million leadership award from the Whitaker Foundation and a $5 million translational research partnership award from the Coulter Foundation. Boston University is the only institution in the nation to have received both awards. Dr. Luchin has been the recipient of the College of Engineering's Professor of the Year Award and Biomedical Engineering Professor of the Year Award twice. In 2011 to 2012, he served as the president of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. He has been on the board of directors for the Biomedical Engineering Society and serves on scientific advisory boards for several bioengineering departments and colleges nationwide. As Dean, Dr. Luchin has orchestrated the creation of a new division of systems engineering and a new division of material science and engineering. He has also created new concentration programs in energy technologies, nanotechnology, and technology innovation. Since becoming Dean, undergraduate freshman enrollment has increased by 30%, and graduate funding per faculty has increased to 21st in the nation. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Dean Luchin to the podium. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, everyone. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, if you're sitting in the audience today, most people are here because of the extraordinarily unusual circumstances of last, fr last Friday which, of course, shut down the city and its surrounding suburbs. Uh, an event that was, in my 30 years here at Boston, unprecedented, just a bizarre day by any measure. And uh, as we know, uh, that day occurred because uh, just five days earlier, there was the tragic and senseless uh, uh, terrorist act at the Boston Marathon. And of course, all of us still have in our thoughts the uh, families of the victims uh, and the families and, uh, and, uh, and uh, people that were injured in that terrible tragedy. Now, um, those of you, everyone in this audience, of course, uh, remembers 9-11 and that horrific uh, terrorist act. Uh, many can recall other terrorist acts across the world that have occurred since then. I'm sure the parents in the audience remember Oklahoma City. And so what we've come to learn, of course, and unfortunately, is that these incidents can and unfortunately will probably continue to occur uh, throughout our lives in random places at various times. Uh, it turns out that uh, in a free society, of course, it's become virtually impossible to protect all the civilized and good citizens of this world and this nation at all places and at all times, and yet still maintain our lifestyle and our free society and our drive for
for what we want to achieve in life. Now, when I thought about the tragedy of this attack uh, in the few days right after it occurred, uh, I realized I had a, an, an additional new reaction to it that I perhaps didn't have as intensely in the previous ones. And it was a, a sense of, uh, of, of real anger uh, about something unique about this one, and that is the attack at the marathon did more than just have a terrible terrorist attack. It attacked a certain event, an event that is widely perceived in the world that celebrates the human spirit, the human drive to have ambition, to endure, and to achieve at levels never thought, before thought possible. And the, it's not just the celebration by the runners, but the celebration of all the fans on the sidelines that go and want the, to, to watch that human spirit achieve at levels it never before could have, thought it could, could achieve. It celebrates what we all try to do in a free society, is to constantly make ourselves better than we ever thought we could make ourselves. And in that sense, it attacked more than just our free society, but the fundamental human spirit. And of course, all of us were then so much more pleased, five days later, while we had to be highly inconvenienced on last Friday, that these two people were brought to justice or close thereof. So let me point out that uh, what we're here about today is, 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 as students, and frankly, as parents of those students, is that fundamental drive to make ourselves better, to have ambition, to achieve something new and powerful to impact society. And so let me go on now with my comments to talk a bit about why we're here and what, why, what you can gain by coming to Boston University and being part of our community. So thank you again for attending. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come on a second time to visit this institution and find out what Boston University is and find out what this College of Engineering is. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk to you about it. And first and foremost, let me start out by congratulating you. You've been admitted to one of the most dynamic, exciting, fastest moving colleges of engineering in the country, in what is one of the a world class, highly regarded university, Boston University, in what is unquestionably one of the best, if not the best city in America to go to college in. Now, um, I've been at this institution for 29 years, and I have seen over and over again its enormous commitment to excellence. And when it means excellence, it means an investment in how to constantly advance the quality of what our fundamental mission is, to educate perpetually generations of students that will go on to impact society and our quality of life in, in extremely in, uh, uh, intensive and excellent ways. Now. Uh, if you do choose to come here, students, your parents and I will have something in common. You, we will be parents of Boston University students or eventually alumni. Three of my children uh, have come here or are about to graduate here. Uh, my oldest daughter graduated a few years ago from the School of Education, got a job right away as a fifth, school, fifth grade school teacher. Right, right away, I did not have to pay her rent. How great is that? I, I still paid her car insurance. Uh, my son went to the School of Management. Uh, he is now graduating, actually, uh, uh, next month uh, with his MBA from uh, Washington University and has a job lined up as a senior business analyst at a major company. So I'm, I'm going to ask him to pay my rent. <laughs> and I have a daughter that's graduating this year in math education from the School of Education uh, in May. And I'm just hoping upon hope that by September I only have to pay her car insurance. I, don't, I really don't care right now where my youngest daughter goes because she's seven years old. Uh, if you've listened to me for the last few minutes, you've probably picked up on a New Yorkish ac accent. Uh, it's true, I did come from New York. I grew up in New York. Uh, but after almost 30 years at Boston, I'm still a Yankee fan. <laughs> Listen, you're doing the right thing. You're taking time out of your lives to come get a deeper sense of what it's like to go to school and be a part of our community and what will happen to you over the four years you're here. You're absolutely doing the right thing. And so let's talk first about the institution that you're going to attend and be an alumni of. Boston University is a world-class institution. It's a liberal arts and professional education institution in an urban environment. It's a major research university. This is critical. If there's any major, if there's any discipline that where you want to be at a university that has a major research component, it's engineering. The technology of our society is changing at an extraordinarily dynamic, rapid pace. 
You need to be taught by people who are at the cutting edge of this technology. Our motto is we need our students to constantly not only understand what our faculty know, but what our faculty do. Our commitment to this is not to just bring in people that are great at research, but have a passion for education. In fact, some of the best teaching faculty in our undergraduate programs are our best researchers. In fact, the number one uh, 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 funded research faculty in the entire College of Engineering is, has been won not only every college and departmental teaching award, has won an award, and he only teaches undergraduate uh, kids, has won the award for the best teacher in the entire university. So we're committed to bringing this research into the classroom, into the fundamental lectures. Um, it's an international university. That's also critical. Uh, so you'll be exposed to a diverse student body, to people from all kinds of countries and cultures. Technology is a global phenomenon. Most, country, uh, most companies have a global footprint. You need to understand how to interact with people from all different cultures and so forth. It's in a, if, you, if you come to Boston University, you'll be exposed to people and courses from the performing arts, business, law, medicine, engineering, religion, philosophy, health and natural sciences, politics, and so on and so forth. And you might say to yourself, well, of course, you know, that makes sense, it's Boston University. But, but, here we are in the mecca of college education. And I ask you, how many of this incredible number of world-class universities and colleges in the Boston area have a college of engineering, a business school, a law school, a medical school, an education school, and a college of fine arts? One, Boston University, and that's just six of our 17 professional schools. So when you come here, you will not just be exposed to other people that want a degree in engineering and faculty. You will be exposed to and learn how to interact with people from all kinds of backgrounds, with all kinds of interest. And this is critical to being someone who knows how to function in society. And of course, we have a university that offers a great social life. I put that in there because I happen to know that firsthand. Remember, I have three children that went to school here. Maybe I know that too well. And um, it's got a great sense of community, and it has a spectacular Fit Rec Center. Uh, if you haven't been to the Fit Rec Center yet, I urge you during the day to go down Commonwealth Avenue, walk in. It's a spectacular facility. I think the largest indoor facility, indoor uh, uh, recreation facility, athletic facility in the nation of any school or college. And my son loved this facility. He kind of slept on that treadmill over there on the far right, stayed in there all the time. He absolutely, absolutely loved it. So let's talk about why you're here today. And let's talk about, first of all, if I said to you, all of you, quickly, in five seconds, answer the following question. Why would you want to go to college to begin with? And if I just gave you five seconds, you'd say, well, of course, to get an education, to get a college ed education. And there's nothing wrong with that answer. Of course, that's important. But I submit, if you had time to really think deeply about it, you would say, what I really want to do is make sure that I have skill sets that give me lifelong learning and lifelong impact skills. Now. If you're sitting in this audience, uh, students, it's it, to, to first, to pretty much first approximation, every one of you ended up in the top 20% of your high school graduating class or are about to, and that's spectacular. But I'm also pretty sure that 80% of you will not be in the top 20% of the cl graduating class four years from now. If you don't understand what I said, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> but it's our job to make 100% of you successful to commit to a program that regardless of the nuances of how you tra traverse the next four years, you're going to be successful. You should still try to be in the top 20%. Uh, if you look at the nation's data, about 45% of students who get a bachelor's degree in engineering in this country, while they, almost all of them start out as engineers, 10 to 15 years later are no longer practicing engineers. They go into management, they go into law, they go into the investment and finance community. They become entrepreneurs, they become doctors. Uh, they become, they went to media. So given that statistic, we would be remiss, we would be irresponsible if our mission was to only train you for a career in engineering. That would be irresponsible to you. We have to make sure that you can be a great engineer and then use that as a foundation to be a great anything, including an engineer. So let's talk about engineering. If I said, why would you be interested in engineering? You would probably say, because I enjoyed and I'm very good at math and science. If that's not true, you're also in the wrong room. Um, but I would s go a little further than that. I would say you want to be an engineer because you have a drive to be creative. And when I say creative, I don't mean uh, like an art artist would be with paint and a brush, but like creative for things that, that you would use your quantitative and scientific skills. You want to understand the world and society depends and will forever depend on technology. But only students, or primarily students, 
that are, have a degree in engineering have the knowledge to understand that technology. That empowers you in extraordinary ways to lead throughout society, again, regardless of whatever career path you might go into. Very few people in this country understand technology. You want to innovate and integrate and impact and galvanize organizations and society. Oh, about maybe uh, eight, nine years ago, the uh, National Academy of Engineering put out a report called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And what they pointed out was that America was in danger of losing its, its, its edge and its leadership and in innovation because other countries and other growing economies were producing engineers at extraordinary numbers and rates. Uh, it, whether it be China or India or other countries, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, three, five hundred thousand engineers were the numbers being thrown around at the time. And the concern was, what about the United States? And what we pointed out, and what our philosophy here is, is we are not going to compete with the rest of the world on the numbers. We don't have the capacity in this nation to produce that many engineers, and, 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 and we won't be able to produce that many, period. Probably we can produce about 100,000 a year if we wanted to. But there is something we have always led in, and we will continue to lead in if we, if we, if we plan correctly. It's the kind of engineer we create. It's an engineer that not is just a good engineer that learns how to work on technology challenge itself, but one has, that has embedded in a drive and a passion and understanding of how to innovate technologies to impact and move society forward. That's what's in the DNA of our country and our, and our citizens. Innovation, constantly entrepreneurial thinking to drive, the, to drive the country and society forward. You can't just snap your fingers and put that into other cultures and, and, and other countries. We have that, and we have to exploit that drive so that the engineers coming out of our programs are going to lead other engineers around the nation to drive the economy and drive society. Engineers innovate, and that's what we have to train you to do. Um, now, the other things that engineers do when they innovate is they create jobs. Not just jobs for other engineers, but when you innovate and drive and create new technologies and create companies around that, you create jobs for all the people that need to support those new technologies. So again, we innovate and we create jobs in this country. Now, the other thing that that organization did is they put together about 15 of the leading engineers in the world, thinkers and creative people in the world, people like, for example, uh, Dean Kamen, who invented the Segway, who's on our advisory board, and Farouk El Baz, who was the person who identified where the Apollo missions should land on the moon, who's at Boston, uh, Boston University in the electrical engineering department. People who invented the Palm Pilot and created, invented tissue engineering and so forth. And asked them, what are the grand challenges that society faces in the next hundred years that will need technology to solve the grand challenges? And let me just show you some of these challenges. Some focus on quality of life and the environment. For example, we need to figure out a way to provide access to clean water, particularly for low resource communities. Notice the phraseology, not create clean water. We know how to do this. Provide access to clean water. That means that the engineers of the future have to figure out how to drive technologies to make it economical, to figure out how to distribute them and get it out into the communities, work with community leaders and politicians and, and the, uh, uh, the supply chain uh, systems that allow this to be able to enable all the people that can't get access to clean water for health reasons. Another one, make solar energy economical. Not make solar energy. We know how to make solar energy. But can we make it economical? Because if we can do that and understand how to distribute it, we've got this virtually unlimited source of clean energy and the, all the implications that has. So you have to re be the engineer that understands how to create it, work with the business people and the supply chain people, the policy people, so you can actually distribute this at low enough cost to make it ubiquitous. There's things like restoring and improving urban function. By the year 2050, there will be 9 billion people on the planet. Almost surely they will cluster around urban centers. We need to transform the way these urban centers function. We are in the midst of doing this by developing wireless sensors to understand how traffic patterns, parking meters, energy is used, is used. visual uh, uh, surveillance systems are used, huge amounts of data uh, to help cities run more efficiently. But again, you can't develop this in isolation. How do you get people to adopt these technologies? How do you get the incentives, the pricing incentives, so that these innovations can actually be worthwhile to create? So the engineers of the future have to work with environmental people, business people, and so forth, community leaders, to get the cities to function. And things like getting CO2 out of the environment, out of the atmosphere, to make uh, the climate changes that we're seeing less likely to have a, a terrible effect on our quality of life. In the areas of health of, uh, and joy of living and security, we're talking about engineering better and personalized medicine. But right now, the 
the uh, pharmaceutical industry is spending billions to develop drugs because so many of the drugs that they think are in the pipeline have to be thrown away because they have bad effects on people when they finally test them and they just don't know which people that will be. But if we can design using genomics and other technologies uh, a personalized approach to this so those monies aren't wasted and we actually give, can give those medicines to the people who won't be negatively affected, we can have a huge impact on the healthcare system. We have faculty here designing, using synthetic biology and engineering approaches to design antibiotics uh, so that they can go after bacteria that are formerly resistant. Now they can go after them. A huge impact on society. Reverse engineering the brain. You may have heard the, uh, President Obama's brain mapping initiative. The brain is the most powerful information processing system known to us in the world. And if we can figure out how it does it, it opens up a massive amount of innovation space for us to play with and improve society. Advancing personalized health care. Huge cost to health care is in the home people who get sick and have to be rushed to the hospitals. If we can personally monitor them and adjust the medications and understand when they're at risk and intervene before they rush to the hospitals, huge impact with an aging population on quality of life and the cost of health care. And of course, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, unfortunately, the world will not suddenly all love each other and do wonderful things. And that we live in a complex world, and we have tremendous challenges to develop defense and cybersecurity systems to make our world and our quality of life maintained. And of course, there's information systems that all of you have heard about that drive our social life that are not just information technologies, but interact with the social communities of, of, this, of our world and have to understand how they function. So, in four years, we need to create not just engineers, but engineers that know how to interact with all these other elements of society and all these other kinds of people, so these technologies and innovation can improve our quality of life. So how do we do that? We do that by generating a fundamental philosophy which drives our undergraduate programs. It's called creating the societal engineer. It's trademark. Six months ago, the US Patent Office granted us this trademark, finding it a unique and powerful concept. What is it? It's a concept that says that the societal engineer is an individual that uses their engineering foundation with enabling attributes to advance society and our quality of life. It's someone that embraces and succeeds with careers and people from all disciplines. It basically states that, it's, that, we, that our mission is not to create people that have an engineering degree in X, and that's the end, beginning and end of our mission. It's to create people who have an engineering foundation and other enabling attributes that empowers them in extraordinary ways to interact with people from all disciplines, no matter what their career path is, to move society vote forward and advance our quality of life. And so how do we do this? Uh, first and foremost, we create great engineers. You have to be grounded in engineering fundamentals you have to go deep in a particular discipline that's well known because throughout life you have to go deep into subject matters and you need to do this at least once here's an undergraduate. And of course you have to develop very powerful quantitative statistical and creative problem solving skills. That is true of every top quality engineering school in the country. If they don't do that you need to run. But we go far deeper than that. We go front and center, pull it up, other attributes which create the societal engineer. You need to understand how to work on inter- and multidisciplinary teams, and even cross-functional teams, teams with engineers of all kinds, business people, marketing people, community leaders. You need to have excellent communication skills that goes beyond the speaking to other, only other engineers, but all kinds of people. You need to develop what we call systems thinking. Why am I working on this? What does this have to do with the entire product? How does a company work as a system? What's the big picture? You need to have global awareness. As I mentioned before, you need to understand how technology and innovation might be different depending on what culture and country you're working in. You need to have an understanding of how public policy affects technology and innovation. And of course, we see this in energy, we see this in healthcare, we see this in information systems and the internet. You need to have, the last three, a unique set of qualities that empowers you to be innovative. So the first one is an entrepreneurial mindset. By that I mean a passion for innovation, an understanding that all the time companies have to figure out how to take an idea or an invention and convert it to a product out the back end. How does a company do that? How does, how, and as an engineer, you need to understand that going out into the world as engineers and understanding that they constantly have to take on risk. You need to understand that. You need to have an understanding of not only how they do that from a business point of view, but technically, how do you go from an idea on a computer design to prototyping it, to then building it, and building it in a way where you, via supply chain management and so forth, you can deploy large amounts of them for profit. What are the technologies associated with that? And when you do all that, you have a social consciousness, which means that you're constantly innovating, you're adding economic value and quality of life. Now, this one bullet here is in red. 
And it's in red for a reason, because when you come here in your freshman year, by the middle of the fall semester, we will open up the Engineering Product Innovation Center, a 15,000 square foot space on Comerv, which is a unique hands-on facility to educate all engineers on product design to deployment to sustainability issues. A powerfully unique concept. It will be um, something that we embed directly into the undergraduate curriculum, a $12 million facility. It will include computer-aided design software that's cutting edge and used by all the major engineering firms in this nation. It will include three-dimensional printing where you can actually print and prototype anything you can imagine in ways that can't be done by current technologies. This is stuff for undergraduates to play with. Laser processing, robotics, and introduction to supply chain management. In short, we're going to embed this throughout the curriculum, and it's going to empower you in ways that you haven't even imagined. Now, let's talk about how we do all this stuff. First, of course, the first two bullets, we make you great engineers. We do that through the curriculum. We have three departments, biomedical, electrical, computer, and mechanical, and they offer four accredited bachelor's degree. Mechanical comes in three flavors. You can take a set, take a set of electives and do a senior design and become a mechanical engineer with a concentration in aerospace engineering, putting you uh, in a position to go into the aerospace in industry. You can do the same thing in manufacturing. We also offer three ubiquitous in, uh, concentrations that cut across all, all disciplines. One is energy technologies and how they connect to the environment. One is in nanotechnology, and one is in technology innovation. The first two attend to the fact that there's a huge growing economic sector in the energy space and in the nano space, nano being the application of engineering at the molecular scale for things like materials for aircraft all the way to delivery of medicines uh, for biomedical applications. And the technology innovation concentration is joint with a school of management where you take courses that introduce you to the fundamental processes where you go from an invention to a product out the back end, marketing, uh, uh, raising capital, intellectual property issues, uh, and so forth. Now, these are set up so you can take the electives, they count towards any of the majors, and you still get your degree in a bachelor's and whatever you get it in, plus a concentration in these if you complete those concentrations without overload. And if you start one of these concentrations and decide that was fine, but you don't want to complete it, that's fine. The course you took counts to whatever major you had. We also have two graduate divisions, one in material science and engineering, and one in systems engineering. And they offer minors at the undergraduate level. In fact, you can major in any major here and minor in any other major here. You can minor in anything outside the College of Engineering, business, music, uh, English. Some engineers actually minor in English. Not a lot, but some. <laughs> <laughs> we start you out in the freshman year. One of the biggest challenges to engineering education in the nation is how do you excite the kids right when they come in as engineers about what is engineering? Because you still have to take some more calculus and some more chemistry and some more physics and so forth. We have a very unique course called the Introduction to Engineering in which every department puts together four or so modules, six-week modules. You have to take two of them as a freshman. They, these are just a sampling. We have 20 or so per semester. And you can see that they're very interesting things that introduce you to how engineering impacts a particular application that impacts society, from stem cells to lighting to wireless network to human brain mapping to clean energy and so forth. These are all offered, both semesters are often, not all the time, every year, and the freshmen love these sequences. Now, how do we go beyond the courses to make you societal engineer and to embed those attributes? We do those with a huge array of experiential opportunities to enhance how you can see the engineering impacting society. For example, you can do undergraduate research and, and or, and or, not or, and or, a co-op and internship with industry. We, f we fund about 130 undergraduates a year to, do, to be research assistant in faculty laboratories during the academic year or during the summer. It's incredible. These are paid positions. Many of these students do research and go to conferences and present their work. In fact, we have a program funded by alumni donations where if a student gets a job offer for the summer, we will pay their housing so they can keep the money for whatever use they want, paid for by alumni donations. We had 60 applications for this program this summer. We only had funding originally, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this, uh, for last summer, sorry. And we had funding for about 15 to 20. I had to run around and call up my alums and say, can you help me fund more of these? I got tons of applications. Of course, it means that there are 60 faculty willing to pay students to be research assistants in the summer. That's what that means. It's incredible. Tons of opportunities. You can get into innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, which means we can take that concentration I told you and take uh, part of all kinds of design contests that we have. We have a, a freshman, uh, we have a uh, innovation contest 
uh, that we used, we, we um, hold throughout the entire year. You can do anything you want. The first year we did this two years ago, the winner was a freshman. We have a program called the Technology Innovation Scholars Program. Your obligation in order to sustain the pipeline of engineers that will innovate and move society forward is to also figure out how can I impassion the kids in middle school, grade school, and high school to continue to do what I'm doing is going to engineering. We have a program where we'll fund our students and train them to go back to middle school, high school, and grade school and talk about what is engineering and why is it so exciting to move society and address society's challenges. These same students will be mentors on first robotics teams throughout the Boston area, and then you can go home to your hometown and do this as well. The first 41 kids we funded for this program reached 5,000 students in K through 12 nationwide. Great program. We have an Imagineering lab on the first floor of the building I'm in. It's a play space. It's a sandbox for undergraduates to just innovate and play. Equipment, mechanical, electrical equipment, computer equipment, and staff with graduate students. And we have design contests in this. The students build everything you can imagine. Super fun place for engineers to play. We have service learning, where engineers want to work on technology challenges to impact lower resource communities, uh, or go and understand how engineering applies to other, other cultures and other countries. And so we have a, a chapter of Engineers Without Borders, or global health programs, in which students work on technologies that, they, that will apply to places like Zambia and Nicaragua and Peru. Uh, and then they actually have faculty, and we have BU has resources in these places to take you there and see how the technologies can be developed. We have study abroad programs in four different places. These study abroad programs are sensational. I've never seen a program in which every single student who participates in this program comes back and said that was the most incredible experience. You learn how to, how to interact with these cultures. Now, I know this firsthand. My children, some of my children did this. My oldest daughter and my youngest daughter, who's graduating this year, both did study abroad programs uh, in, in Australia. Australia is, is really far away. Like, like like really far. But parents, relax through Skype, of course. You, 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 you can maintain interaction with them in a very personalized way. My daughters figured out, both of them, how to Skype me. And of course, because of the time difference, every morning around 6 or 6.30, they would Skype me, and, and we'd talk and see how they're doing almost every day. In fact, every, every day, every, every single day, 6, six in the morning. <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, every day. Um, but as I said, they're not for everyone. My son is more of a home, but he would have done a, he would have done a study abroad program uh, if it was in Brookline, for example. I think he would have done that. But, but uh, a lot of kids love this program. It's a great program. Um, we have a fantastic senior capstone design sequence for all the majors. It doesn't matter what it was. They do incredible things. Uh, the student on the top right, uh, he, he actually figured out how to control a computer cursor with his thoughts. How? using the signal from an MRI machine. It was a fantastic project. He actually had made this work. Uh, on the right, uh, we had a, a, a team of students work with a faculty on a global health challenge. They designed a way with a little device there to figure out the oxygen levels in the blood so they can rapidly and in real time figure out if children were at risk of developing pneumonia in low resource communities. The trick here was they powered the device with a battery that was recharged by the sun, and it was a cell phone battery because the only technology that's ubiquitous in these communities is often cell phones. And so they brought that team to uh, Nicaragua to, to try to figure out um, uh, how, what the applications you know, would be and how to really develop this technology further, and it's going further. And this team on, the, on your left, bottom left, they figured out how to put Boston University on a trash can. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, what they figured out, it's actually kind of clever, they figured out how to put a wireless sensor in, inside a, a can. A huge waste of fuel is to have these incredibly uh, inefficient uh, um, trash collecting trucks drive around and stop at every single home. They figured out a way to wirelessly tell the, the, the driver which cans are full enough that they should actually stop that week or not, saving a lot of fuel for the uh, community and the, city, and the city. Pretty clever stuff. We understand that it's expensive to go to school here, but more importantly, we understand that we have an obligation to worry about not just the input, not just what happens when you're here, but the output. And so we work very hard to get you ready and prepared to be successful as you go on to the next level when you graduate through our career development office. We engage you right when you walk in the door. It's a holistic approach. We introduce you to this office. We introduce you to the career office open houses. We have um, uh, uh, career development uh, company fairs which have interns as well as real jobs. 
We want you to uh, understand how to write a resume, what internship opportunities there might be. Uh, even at the junior year, you're already getting deeply involved in mentoring, resume workshops, interview workshops, but even just fundamental professional skills. How do you, not only how you interview in a formal interview, if you have an informal interview in an elevator, how do you act when you go out for dinner or a meal on a business lunch, dinner, or interview? What order should you use the utensils in? Parents know what I mean. Don't start with the stuff on the top of the plate. Don't, those are the end stuff. Um, so, so how are we doing? We're doing, we're doing very well. We, 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 um, we have alums that are leading drivers of biomedical companies and industry. We have alums that are in leadership positions in the information technology industries. We have alums that are in leadership positions in the, in the aviation and aerospace industries, in the computer industries, uh, in, in, I said, the aerospace industries, in the investment and financial communities, and in the entertainment industries. And that's just the name of a few of these. We are growing. We have been adding about seven, eight faculty a year for, since I've been dean six, seven years ago. During the 08, 09 year, the worst economic year you, in all of our memories, we hired, I think, 11 faculty that year. Uh, we've had a 30% increase in the size of the freshman class. We've now steady steady that out because we, we underestimated the interest in the societal engineering concept. And we had the largest, the largest applications ever in the history of the College of Engineering last year. This is the most selective we've ever been by far in admitting students to the College of Engineering. And we've had a huge growth in the number of students participating in those experiential opportunities I told you about. Now, and most of them are doing more than one. Now, with regard to those experiential opportunities, this is the critical issue for us. Because, as I mentioned, we don't want to take a mission where we're preparing you for one and only one career path, a career in industry. If that was our singular mission, we thought that was the primary thing we're doing, is setting you up for an entry-level job in industry, then we would have only a co-op and only an internship program. But we figure out that we, need, we have a huge array of students who aren't really sure what they want to do. And they might want to be prepared for that so they can take an internship, but many want to go and then sample and do a research idea, or a service engineering idea, or work on the first robotics mentoring, or work on a design competition, or do, work, do, an, do anything they want in these experiential opportunities. So we have this array of opportunities to make sure that you can identify where exactly you want to go in your life, and you're not pigeonholed into a singular career path. And we have these where you're exposed to all kinds of people so that in the next four years, rather than simply surround yourself with like-minded people, you get exposed to all kinds of people. And all of this has been, by the way, enabled a lot by alumni donations. In the last four years, donations to the annual fund have gone up by 400%. The worst economic years I remember in my lifetime. The alumni are totally buying into this concept. So unfortunately, I won't have time for questions right now. But it's really been a privilege and an honor to have an opportunity to speak to you all about the engineering school here at Boston University. If you're sitting in the audience, you've already been through a major filter. You've been admitted to, through a very rigorous process. I can assure you that there are students that apply to our engineering school who had similar SAT scores and similar GPA scores. But when we looked at those applications, they didn't seem the right fit for the program we put together to create the societal engineer. Our evaluation of your portfolio is you're ready and you will enjoy this, this, this program. And so, as you, for those of you still making choices, it's a stressful choice for sure, but don't worry. You're going to get the choice right, because it's going to be your choice. But I can assure you, if you choose to come to Boston University, four years from now, four years from now you're going to look back and say, wow, what a great choice. Enjoy the day, and congratulations again. Thank you, Dean Luchin. We will now welcome Associate Dean Saul Eisenberg. Professor Eisenberg has served the College of Engineering in many capacities over the past 30 years. He completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After receiving all that education, he realized he should come to Boston University. And he did so in 1983. He has a dual faculty appointment in the college as professor of biomedical engineering 
and Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. In 1990, Professor Eisenberg received the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. This is among the highest awards given at Boston University for teaching. In 1998, Professor Eisenberg was appointed Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs in the College of Engineering, and he continues to hold this appointment today. He is the chief architect of the college's study abroad programs. These are among the few abroad programs designed exclusively for engineering students. In September 2008, Dean Eisenberg was additionally appointed chair of the biomedical engineering department. When not teaching classes or meeting his many other responsibilities, Professor Eisenberg performs research on electrically mediated phenomena in tissues and biopolymers. It's my pleasure to welcome Dean Eisenberg. Thank you, Jane, and good morning, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure also to extend my congratulations to you on reaching uh, these decision points, uh, which you're going to be making in the near future. Um, today, I want to elaborate on two programs that uh, Dean Luchin mentioned, uh, specifically the Engineering Study Abroad programs and our senior project programs. These are both programs that we're really extremely proud of, and uh, yeah. We want to just share them with you because they're pretty unique to uh, what's available at Boston University to engineering students. So we, as you've heard, have engineering study abroad programs. These programs are designed to expose students who opt to participate in them to uh, another culture and mostly in preparation for what we believe will be um, careers in this global economy. Um, students are going to be involved in teams that are uh, span the globe or they're going to have time during their career that they're going to be abroad. We think it's important to get out of the United States and actually be embedded in another culture for some uh, significant amount of time um, and that helps them to understand what it means to be uh, from in, in the position of the other in a different culture and there are a lot of transition and, and translatable uh, skill sets that evolve from those experiences that will aid them if they happen to be in the country that they uh, have visited or if they're uh, posted somewhere else around the world or have to work with engineers elsewhere. Um, we have two sets of programs. There's a second semester sophomore program that's designed, that's available for all engineering students. It's meant to be seamless with what goes on on campus here in the second semester of the sophomore year. Um, these are in countries where English is not the spoken language, but uh, the language of instruction in all these programs in is in English, so they do not require a prior language experience, although we expect them to uh, be committed to learning uh, the language of the host country while they're there, and we expose them to intensive language courses in order to do that. Um, these programs are available to students with no additional cost, so that your Boston tuition Boston University tuition covers the cost of, of going abroad, including uh, round trip travel, uh, one, one trip back and forth, so they, we, we send them out, they come back uh, as part of that program. Um, and most importantly, they don't add time to degree. Um, we have four of these programs operating today, one in Dresden, one in Grenoble in France, uh, one in Tel Aviv, Israel, and Madrid, Spain. Um, we also have a set of programs in the junior year that are available. These are direct enroll programs at host institutions where the language of instruction is in English so that direct enrolling is possible. Um, often curricular adjustments are required. It doesn't work for every major in every semester. Some programs are more able to travel in the fall. Some are more able to travel in the spring, and that depends on local things. These are available today at places where BU has relationships, um, and we have them at the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia, uh, which as Dean Luchin noted is very far away. Um, in, in Dublin, um, in Auckland, New Zealand, which is almost as far away, and in Singapore, which is also almost as far away. So Dublin's the closest one. Why do we think this is important? Why have we spent this time to partner with our, our colleagues in our study abroad programs? Um, 
because we think that engineers today need to have this global perspective, we think it's really important and we think getting outside the boundaries of the United States is critical um, in developing this skill set more fully. Um, you've all heard the flat world paradigm and we believe that engineers today um, are going to be engaged through their careers somehow either in teams that span the globe or by having, uh, being posted abroad. Um, and this is really a, an additional value added that we can provide to students because we believe our students will really be in leadership positions in engineering domains as they go forward throughout their careers. Um, the program, I'm going to talk now about the sophomore program because that's the one that's sort of just seamless. So if a student wants to go, they really can go. Um, it's a one semester program for second semester sophomore engineers. It's open to all engineering majors. It includes all of the required technical coursework that students would be normally taking here. It's replicated to our specifications and taught by our partners in these institutions abroad in English. Um, and in addition to the coursework, we also have intensive language instruction and a social science course that's about the place so that they learn something about the history and culture of the host country. This structure allows for normal progress through the degree. They get what they would have had had they stayed here, but they just have it abroad in terms of the educational part, which enables them to have all of these other attributes and experiences that, that accrete from an experience, a sustained experience abroad. Um, for the geographically challenged, I just want to point out that, you know, we're here. Madrid is in Spain, Grenoble is in France, Dresden is in what used to be East Germany, is another interesting uh, place, and Tel Aviv is in, is in Israel in the Middle East. Um, just the local uh, geography, uh, Dresden is, is over here in the southeastern corner, well, I saw the middle, middle eastern corner, this is really South Germany, but uh, just above the Czech Republic, it's about two hour train to Prague, another two hours up to Berlin, very accessible. Um, Dresden has emerged, it's, it has a long tradition, it's an 800 year old city, a long tradition of being really the industrial base of Germany um, in Saxony, that's the, the state that, that Dresden is in, and during the time behind the Iron Curtain, um, uh, from World War II until 1989, really was uh, a linkage uh, into uh, the, the Soviet Union at the time. And those linkages remain today. It's really a bridge now from Germany into, into those uh, economies, and it is uh, evolving and really developing as a, as a major city. I've had the benefit of uh, having visited in 1999, which was 10 years out, and visited almost annually, not quite um, since then, and it's really a city that is on the move and has been evolving and, and growing very significantly. Um, in Israel, we operate at Tel Aviv University, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, the area from Tel Aviv up to Haifa, uh, where the Technion is, is, is really become a bastion of high-tech uh, research and development um, Every single national, multinational company that has a research, a global research environment has a footprint uh, in Israel and a lot of things that, 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 that come out of that ecosystem. Um, it's really a very dynamic place and exciting to be in. Um, uh, that's a shot uh, of, of modern Tel Aviv uh, from the university. And uh, there also our students get a chance to travel in the local environs. In France, we're operating uh, with in Grenoble, and in Grenoble is actually here, not there. I don't know why we haven't fixed that, but that's okay. Um, it's close to Lyon. It's also close to Geneva. It's in the Alps. Skiing is uh, reportedly terrific, even uh, this week, I understand, from our students there. Um, so skiing goes late in the Alps uh, into the spring. And... Um, there are some of our students in, in the warmer times and up, uh, this is, they're sitting on top of the building that houses uh, the Boston University offices and you can see a nice shot of, uh, of the Alps in the background. That's about a half hour away for those of you that like to ski. Um, it's not the only thing going on there. It's close to CERN. Um, there are a lot of, uh, again, Grenoble is a, an old university town. It's a reason it's smaller than, than the Boston area. Um, but it is a quite a dynamic uh, old European uh, city that's extraordinarily important to the educational infrastructure of France and Europe. 
Um, in Spain, uh, we just began operating in Madrid, which is the capital. Madrid is a sprawling metropolis. We work there with the uh, Autonoma de Madrid, uh, which is one of the large public institutions there. Um, and again, it's, it's uh, centrally located. Students have been known to spend time uh, both on the, uh, the, the, the Mediterranean coast and uh, traveling uh, around Europe. Uh, there's some wonderful sites in Madrid. That's the Prado, uh, just a superb uh, art institute and museum um, with amazing stuff in it. And uh, that's a group of our students sitting on the Place de Sol, de Sol I believe, um, which is one of the main uh, squares that's close to some of the transportation hubs in the central city of Madrid. So those are great programs. I'm happy to talk more about them. You should, as you go through the day, talking to uh, undergraduates. Uh, many of them have been abroad on these programs. And I'm sure if you uh, ask questions about it, they'll be very enthusiastic reporters of the kinds of experience they had. I want to switch gears now and go to the end of our programs, uh, the senior design project programs. Uh, these are required by all of our undergraduate majors. They tend to be year-long capstone experiences. They often involve corporate clients or partnerships. They're um, entrepreneurial in nature in many in instances, product-oriented, and sometimes the students are embedded off-site, uh, off-campus at industrial sites. Not all the time, but these are sort of a common thread of, of uh, flavor of experience. I'm going to run through a couple of projects uh, just to give you a sense of the things that the, the range of projects that our students have done over the last couple of years. This is that trash can problem where the students figured out how to put Boston University on a trash can. This is a different picture. It doesn't have Boston University on it. And in fact, it's, it's a site that we've seen, I'm sure all of us around town, um, that you get places where the trash is overflowing and in other places nothing's happening. Uh, the, the, the trash bins are empty, yet the public utility workers, serve, uh, sanitation workers, are visiting every can every day or on whatever schedule they're on, and it's all on that schedule and not on a demand basis, and this can be an expensive process. Uh, by instrumenting a cash can, um, you can actually um, transmit to the, the uh, public sanitation workers where they need to visit because there are full cans or almost full cans, um, and uh, which they can skip because they're, they're not full at all. Here is one implementation of it in a public park. Um, you can see that there was a baseball game uh, that afternoon, and this can is, is red and is broadcasting out to the sanitation workers, come, come service me. These are yellow. If they're coming to this red one, they'll probably service those yellow ones, but they won't bother with these because they're really empty. And so they can take what would have been I don't know, a half an hour uh, in meandering through the park and, and cut that down in time and, uh, and end up with a more um, effective collection process. Um, and this is an implementation that was designed by some students in electrical engineering. Um, moving to biomedical engineering, here was a project that was addressing a need in the developing community. Um, that uh, you know, pneumonia is a leading killer of children under five. They estimate from the World Health Organization about 1.8 million deaths a year. Uh, one of the symptoms is, is low oxygen level in the blood, uh, less than 90 percent. And it was designed or desired that they be able to create a divor uh, device for low resource environments that would measure the oxygen saturation in blood remotely through, through the skin. They were going to do this constrained by the fact that in most places where they wanted to do this, you couldn't rely on, on the electrical grid. Uh, cost was always an issue. There are a few, few trained professionals as you get far out into the, <clears throat> into the uh, you know, out of the cities in these low resource environments. And it was desirable to do this for both adults and infants. What they did was design and built a solar powered uh, pulse oximeter that was able to measure uh, pulse and the saturation of oxygen in the blood that was robust and easy to use. It was low cost, under $100, and it was able to uh, be used by both infants and children. And that's the, 
the, the unit that they had, they were able to make this thing, you stick your finger in it, it does everything that it needs to do. It's not unlike what happens in, in uh, the Western countries. If you go in, that's the first thing they put on your, th on your finger. Uh, but the point is that this had a solar array attached and would be usable out in the field with no real training. Um, uh, they were powering it. This solar array was, was actually powering cell phone batteries because Cell phone batteries are ubiquitous in low resource environments. Cell phones have just sort of become a ubiquitous feature. So the supply chain for the kinds of batteries that you have access to readily in those environments happen to be cell phone batteries, whereas the things that we think of as readily available, like double A's or, or uh, rechargeable uh, C batteries, are, are much less available in these environments. So they were able to, to uh, latch onto that in terms of what was available on site. Uh, they did some 3D uh, modeling and, and printing of the final device. So that was, again, that was a project that was uh, awarded the best senior project the year that, that this project was done in, uh, in biomedical engineering. Here's a project that comes out of the mechanical engineering department with a concentration in aerospace engineering. Um, one thing about our aerospace programs is you, you, you get to design things, but you really don't often get to build aircraft in universities. So, they can only do the paper designs uh, and the analysis, and they produced a little video to explain what they did. This was a humanitarian aircraft, a drone basically unmanned that would be able to uh, bring supplies into areas that, that needed them uh, in res responding to uh, natural or man-made disasters. Let's see how the sound is. So just a small taste of the kinds of things uh, that you can look forward to should you choose to come to Boston University. Again, we're, we're delighted that you're here and we're able to make adjustments in your schedules to be here. We appreciate that. Uh, we know the deadlines are approaching. We invite you today to take your time to ask questions, both of faculty, uh, staff, students. You're going to be able to interact with all of those through the course of the day. Um, we hope that you're able to evaluate your opportunities at Boston University, and we invite you to make the most informed decision, the one that will be right for you, as Dean Luch had mentioned. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to speaking with you later. Thank you, Dean Eisenberg. We will now proceed with the college orientation presentation by a talk from Professor Ted DeWinter. Professor DeWinter has been a member of the BU faculty since 1963. Educated at Bowdoin College and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he spent 29 years in industry, 16 of those as co-founder and vice president of Magnetic Corporation of America. Professor DeWinter came to the United States at age 18, and English is his third language. He teaches courses in engineering economy, computer-aided design and manufacture, and introduction to engineering. Professor DeWinter was awarded the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2002. He was also chosen as the Professor of the Year by the class of 2007. 
Professor DeWinter has served as the chairman of the Boston University Faculty Council. Please welcome Professor DeWinter. Thanks very much, Jane. Let me add my welcome and congratulations to those you've heard before, and an additional congratulations for selecting engineering as a career. Engineering is a great career. It teaches you to analyze problems and to look at what resources are available to you to solve those problems. It is a delightful combination of common sense and the analytical. The analytical is what we teach you here. The common sense, unfortunately, cannot be taught in classrooms. Uh, but uh, many of the students who go to internships manage to pick up a reasonable amount of common sense there. Excuse me, ah, tank array, nothing. <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about discipline, and I want to explore three meanings of the word discipline. And the first is the discipline, which is the engineering discipline. And the engineering discipline is characterized by a very heavy dose of mathematics, calculus mostly, uh, by a dose of physics and chemistry. And a lot of students who enter an engineering program and see those science and math courses maybe think, maybe engineering is not for me. Well, those courses are not engineering. They're fundamental and they're necessary to engineering. And in order to get you oriented right, we have a course that Dean Luchin described, which is Introduction to Engineering, which allows you to contact uh, professors directly and to see what their pet projects are and to hear why they got into engineering. So that's a very important part of engineering. And so engineering really, uh, in addition to analytical and common sense, uh, the central, I say, more or the central sense of engineering is to look ahead and see where there might be a problem. And then in your design, you either determine that your design can handle that problem or you make sure that the problem never happens. And uh, you can apply this in your personal life. I was looking ahead to a time where I might have an annual checkup and my doctor would tell me that uh, he's cutting me back, she's cutting me back to uh, one glass of wine a day. And I was browsing through the Hamacher Schlemmer uh, mail order catalog, a very upscale mail order catalog, and they had a stemmed wine glass there that held a whole bottle. <laughs> and I said, uh, hey, bingo, you know, I'm, I'm prepared for that one. So that's looking ahead for a problem and making sure that you can cope with it. Incidentally, I've tried it about seven or eight times. It makes for a very mellow Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> but uh, in addition to the meaning of the discipline describing the engineering itself, and you need to master these courses, and you need to also be able to speak engineering and communicate. Engineers communicate unambiguously, unlike lawyers, okay? and they want to communicate concisely. And they use words like Hooke's Law, which is the elastic behavior of materials, of all structural materials. And uh, they also use terms like isotropy and anisotropy. It's an interesting word. Iso, of course, mean e means equal. An isobar is a line of equal pressure. An isotherm is a line of e equal temperature. Isotropy means something has the same properties in all directions. And anisotropy means it does not. So anisotropy means something has different properties in one direction than the other. And I brought this very simple piece of wood here to demonstrate this. And I'm going to make a little bridge. So this is a board. And this board has grain, which runs in this direction. And I've got a couple of supports here. I'm going to make a bridge and stand on it. And this board is quite rugged and holds me very nicely standing on it. Now, if I try it in the other direction, with the grain running not across the bridge, but in parallel to the two supports, it doesn't have nearly that strength. Okay? That's anisotropy. Remember that. <laughs> The second discipline, which is very important when you sign on for the first one, the second discipline is self-discipline. The irony is that when you come to Boston University or any university, you're going to be on campus 24 hours a day. That's an unbelievable luxury of time. And there's nobody here to ask you if you don't have any homework for tomorrow. Haven't you watched enough senseless television? 
Aren't you through improving your time on Minesweeper or something important like that? There's nobody here. And in the absence of that, you might think that everything is fine when academically you're going right down the toilet. And so we have a course, which is a seminar, which we call EK100, which is not for credit, but you meet every Friday afternoon for an hour uh, with 10 other freshmen and an undergraduate student, a student advisor, and your faculty member. And you'll be asked, do you have any problems? Do you need any help? Now, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So we have all kinds of help, and really the key thing is to survive the first semester. And this course is designed to do that. And frequently we sense that uh, some of the social pressure that uh, Dean Lucian mentioned, uh, you know, are present. And this one day I was teaching this large lecture class, and a kid in the middle of the class was out cold. And so as professors or teachers I want to do, I focused on this kid, stared at him so that when he came to, his embarrassment would be complete. <laughs> and I said to the student next to him, would you wake him up, please? And this student looked me right in the eye and said, you wake him up, you put him to sleep. <laughs> I decided right then and there that was never gonna happen to me again. And in a smaller section of the same course, several years later, this kid came in, put his head on the lectern, and just conked off. And he was on through the whole class. And you know, at the end of each class, there's sort of a terminal rustling. Kids start to put their pencils and their notebooks away in their backpacks, and it's sort of a signal to the professor, hey, we're out of here very shortly. And before that happened, I said to the class, I'd like your cooperation. I'd like to see if we can get out of this classroom without waking Sleeping Beauty. And so everybody got out quietly, and every classroom has a window next to the door, and I stood there watching as the next class filed in, and the lecture started, and about 20 minutes later, the kid came to, looked around, didn't have a clue where he was. <laughs> I said, yeah, that time I won. You know? <clears throat> but the other thing also is that uh, every once in a while, you see students who, uh, who want to go to an event, and you've got your own priorities. And I was giving a take-home exam, and this student said, uh, Professor DeWinter, can I have some extra time on this take-home exam? I'm going to the Frozen Four, where BU was playing in the hockey tournament. And I said, yeah, you can have some extra time. Do me a favor, though. When you come back, bring me a program of the hockey you know, event. I want to see what happened there. And he came back, and he was crestfallen. It was the longest overtime game we ever played. It's three overtimes, and we lost. He said, that's a the most depressing thing I ever went through it. I could have just as well stayed for your lecture. <laughs> so I wondered if there's a nugget of truth in there somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, the final discipline is an interesting one. It is neither your self-discipline nor the one that explains engineering. It is the discipline of being at Boston University and taking advantage of the many things we have here. And we have all kinds of lectures here. We have world figures coming here that you have a chance to actually meet, ask questions of, shake hands with. Uh, we have Elie Wiesel, uh, the great Nobel Peace Laureate and Holocaust survivor. He gives a series of three lectures every fall. And these lectures are open to the public, and there are 3,000 people there. They close the doors at 7, and nobody's allowed to enter when he started. And I tell all my students, I said, look, you know, 10 years or whenever, when you see his obituary, and it'll be on the front page of the New York Times, are you going to say, oh, yeah, I was there when he was at BU? Or are you going to say, like Jacob Miller did, I met the man, and I shook his hands. And he came to my office, and he said, you know, Professor DeWinter, thank you for making me go listen to Elie Wiesel. I said, I didn't make you go. I just said, it's something not to miss. He said, well, I went. And afterwards, there was a reception. And I went, and I shook hands with him. And talked to him and found out that my grandfather and he might have been on the same train between concentration camps. Now, most of you will not have the kind of experience, but you will have the opportunity to meet Elie Wiesel and to listen to him. And so this is very important. And I'd like to thank my colleagues here for putting up with me every, I've done this probably 10 years straight, three times a year. They've heard this story so, so many times they could probably tell it themselves. It reminds me of a story uh, in the heels of BP uh, BP's disaster in the, in the Mexican Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon, they figured the image needed some improving. And they hired this geologist to come talk to the new members of the board of directors. And this geologist explained how they explore for oil, how they extract it, how they transport it, they refine it and distribute it. And it was such a complete story that BP figured it was great for the image of the company. 
if they got him to give this talk all over the country. So they hired him as a consultant, provided him with a chauffeur-driven limousine. They go all over the country. About six months into this program, they're driving to this university where he's going to give the talk to an audience of about 20,000 in the big field house. And the chauffeur wistfully turns around and says, you know, life isn't fair. Uh, you get this huge amount of money for giving this talk. I sit in the back row and drive you to all these places. I've heard your speech so many times, I could give it myself and probably do a better job than you do. And the geologist says, sort of challenged about this, and he said, you know, uh, we're about the same size. Why don't you pull over the side of the road? I'll put on your uniform, and you can put on my suit, and we'll see how well you do. To make a long story short, chauffeur gives a stem winder of a speech. When he's done, standing O, the president of the university gets up and says, ladies and gentlemen, there's about a half an hour before the next classes. Are there any questions? <laughs> and in the middle of the audience, middle-aged gentleman, tweed jacket, stands up, said, suppose a million years ago a dinosaur died. Over the years, 5,931 feet of sediment have built up on the remains. You're drilling and you strike the fossil. You extract the soil sample. What's the name of the stratum from which you extracted the sample? And what's the pH of the sample? And there's a long pregnant silence. Finally, he says, you know, I've given this speech all over the country. This is by far the dumbest question I've ever heard. <laughs> He said, I don't understand how you could even be a student in this university, let alone a faculty member, which you appear to be. And just to show you how dumb this question is, I'm going to ask my chauffeur in the back row to answer it. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, we look forward to seeing you here in the fall. And I want to give you a piece of advice. If you spent a year at Boston University, and there aren't one or two professors who greet you by name when they meet you on the street, you have not gotten your time or your money's worth. You need to connect personally with these professors. And let me just say another thing. When you're in my class, you're there because you have to be. You have to take the notes. You have to find out what the material is about. When you come to my office, you're there because you want to be. That makes a difference to me. It's flattering to have students come to me for advice and for questions and answer. So our doors are open. Look forward to seeing you here in September. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to start back up with our morning presentation. My name is Ruthie Jean, and I am the Director of Undergraduate Programs in the College of Engineering. It's my pleasure to talk with you this morning about our curriculum and the opportunities that we offer to undergraduates. A lot of the topics that I'm going to cover this morning have been touched upon from our earlier speakers. I hope I'll be able to go into a little bit more detail for you to understand some more of the nuts and bolts, and perhaps sometimes also just confirm some categorizations of different programs. The folders that your sons and daughters were given this morning inside, there's additional content about some of the programs I will cover as well, so you might want to use those as a reference point to you. You heard Dean Luchin talk about the concept of the societal engineer. Obviously, we embrace this concept here at Boston University. We believe the societal engineer embodies opportunity, passion, and ambition for innovation, leadership, and lifelong impact. We've mentioned that, of course, we think our engineering graduates will have a solid technical foundation in the essential engineering fundamentals. But in addition, they will learn creative, quantitative problem solving, systems level thinking, and they will gain a global awareness and entrepreneurial mindset, and we think and hope that they will learn to communicate effectively. We encourage students to incorporate public policy consideration and an awareness of social consciousness, consciousness into their work. We really feel that the engineer who can synthesize these concepts with their engineering training will truly make a difference and will be able to address the complex problems our society faces. Boston University at the College of Engineering, we provide opportunities for students to study technical disciplines while incorporating a liberal arts foundation. We've talked about our degree programs. You know these are the degrees that we offer. These are the concentrations that students can also pursue. And as we've mentioned, any student in any degree can pursue concentrations in energy technologies, nanotechnology, and tech innovation. Those who study mechanical engineering have the additional option of aerospace and manufacturing 
manufacturing for concentrations. This is our curriculum, and I want to give you some exposure to what the actual courses are that our students will take while they are here. So you see here the first semester of classes that a typical freshman would take. We do understand that there is some manipulation needed for this curriculum for students who have uh, credits when they start our program. But for the most, the majority of our students, this is the default start semester, starting semester. Calculus, chemistry, introduction to engineering, writing, and the freshman advising seminar. The Introduction to Engineering course is a six-week module course, so students take two six-week modules of their choosing. The topics that we have range a whole host of options. They are in your folders for those of you on campus here today. But students basically pick something that's of interest to them. If they think they might want biomedical engineering, they can pick a biomedical engineering module. And they can make different combinations as they choose. I'll come back to that freshman advising seminar that you see listed here. After the first semester, students continue and they go straight across with this being what would be a typical spring semester of a freshman year, a typical fall sophomore semester, and a typical spring semester for the sophomore year. So you see that students obviously take a lot of calculus, they take a good amount of science as well, and then we have these engineering components. With introduction to engineering, engineering computation, which is programming, mechanics, electric circuits, and then our freshman advising seminar, we feel that those five courses really start to help students understand what the disciplines are within engineering that we offer. We think that students get a pretty good technical foundation coursework exposure through these courses, and that also helps them as they have to decide their major. Students do not have to declare a major when they start in our engineering program. Many of your sons and daughters have told us, I think I want biomed, I think I want electrical, or any of the degrees we offer. And that's great, but it is not set in stone. They can change their mind because of the nature of this curriculum. Everyone's taking pretty much the same classes, no matter what major they're pursuing. The engineering courses help give some exposure into the, some of our disciplines with computation programming, mechanics, circuits, and then of course through our advising seminar, we have some additional opportunities for exposure. I want to also highlight our, our general education requirements. Students are required to complete a full year of writing in the College of Engineering. AP exams do not exempt them from this. They all have to take writing, much to some of their chagrin. Um, but they also will take social sciences and humanities. Over the course of the entire four years, this is only representing two years, over four years, students will take 24 credits of writing, humanities, and social sciences courses. And this is just to help expand their uh, exposure and breadth of knowledge throughout the degree. Students who seek an integrated structured foundation in the humanities and social sciences may choose to enroll in the College of Arts and Sciences core curriculum and this is listed here as well as an alternative. The core curriculum does fulfill the writing social sciences and humanities requirements if it is completed um, and that is that whole 24 credit requirement that will be fulfilled through the core curriculum. So the freshman advising seminar, I kept saying I'll come back to that. Professor DeWinter talked about this a little bit, and I want to give you just some more information on what this class really is. It does meet every week, as he mentioned. We have a small group and a large group schedule. The small group will start the first week of school, and so in that first Friday, your sons or daughters would meet with their faculty advisor and a student advisor who's a junior or senior in our program, and they'll talk about sort of how the adjustment has been. That first week, it's a lot of details. Have you gone to class? Have you called home? Do you have everything set up for your classes? Have you gotten all your books? All those little odds and ends. But it's a great chance to make sure that we have gotten all of those odds and ends addressed in that first week. After that, we go into a large group session where we address the different programs. The large group sessions are all of the freshman engineers that we have, and we'll talk about the different degrees we offer, we'll talk about special programs, Dean Luchin will come and address the class and talk about ways to enhance the degree, so things they can consider beyond just the coursework that they must complete. 
And the large groups, as I said, they alternate between large and small groups. So we'll have a large group, and then we'll go back to small group. And in small group, they'll meet with that faculty advisor again and that student advisor and talk about ethics. And it just the schedule continues throughout the first semester. This course really serves as a vehicle for us by which we can keep tabs on the freshman class because every week they are addressed with this course, either through our large group where they see all the counselors or in small group where they're meeting with their faculty and student advisors. So it really helps us get a sense of how people are adjusting. If a faculty advisor or a student advisor senses something is going awry for a student, then they'll give us that alert as counselors and we'll ask that student to come in and talk with us so we can identify appropriate resources for a student. Since the College of Engineering is embedded within a much larger university, there are an array of opportunities students can pursue in special academic programs. All of these programs here are beyond the degree, so students can add them as complements to the degree program to help them pursue their goals. Students may pursue a minor in engineering, and here you see listed the different areas where students can pursue a minor within our school. Students can also minor in an area outside of engineering, taking advantage of the different degree programs that Boston University offers. We have many students who combine interests in the humanities or social sciences with their engineering degree because that's just their interest that they have. So it's a neat chance for students to gain more exposure into those fields. The dual degree program enables a student to pursue two bachelor degrees at the university. So a student may receive a bachelor of science degree in engineering, and they may receive a bachelor of arts in physics or in English. All sorts of different combinations do exist. The dual degree program tends to take more than four years for a student to complete because they are fulfilling requirements of two undergraduate programs. A neat combination I always remember was a student who was studying biomedical engineering with us and chose to study film in the College of Communication, and that student is now making movies on the heart. I just thought that was a great way to really fulfill that student's goals. Well-qualified undergraduates in engineering are also eligible to apply for early admission to a Master's of Engineering program, which is a one-year professional master's degree pro program, and it's designed to prepare students for careers in industry. Students can apply for this program in the fall of their senior year of their undergraduate program. We have a new joint program with the School of Education called STEEP, the STEM Educator Engineer Program. And this five-year program adds a Master of Arts in Teaching degree to a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering. This enables students to teach in the STEM fields with certification for middle school or high school in 44 states. The M-Medic program allows biomedical, pre-medical engineering students to apply for admission to the Boston University School of Medicine in the sophomore year of study. Students who are accepted take both medical school classes and biomedical engineering classes. So it does not condense the time, but it's early exposure to medical school courses. Students take med school classes in that junior and senior year. And students who pursue this program find that to be a real advantage to them to have that exposure. And they're anxious to start their med school work, so they really find it exciting. You've heard us talk quite a bit about our study abroad programs. I won't go into more detail on those. I just want to remind you that they do not extend the time for the student to complete the degree, and there is no additional cost for a student to participate in study abroad at Boston University and the College of Engineering. We understand that a lot, of, a lot of our students want to get involved in research, and we have a very, very active research community here at the university. So we have committed different ways to help students pursue research and have the actual funding. The Presidential Scholars Program is a 20,000-year merit-based grant issued to students upon admission to Boston University. This program has an additional component where we will fund students to work in a lab for 10 hours a week for one semester. So a student is free to a professor because the college will pay for their work in that lab for that semester. The Luchin Distinguished Fellowship Program provides $10,000 fellowships to students at the time of admission to Boston University. The fellowship allows students, with, uh, gives them support to work in a lab with a faculty member in the College of Engineering for the summer after their sophomore or junior year. 
The Summer Term Alumni Research Funds Program provides summer housing for students who want to conduct research full time in the summer. And then SURF and Europe are additional funding opportunities where students can work with faculty. SURF is going to be for faculty in the College of Engineering, and Europe allows students to work with faculty in engineering or in one of the other schools and colleges at the university. We realize that research is really fundamental to many of our students, and so we have tried to provide different vehicles for students to take advantage of that opportunity while they are here on campus. We provide many student support services for students in the university. The Educational Resource Center is a university facility, so all students can take advantage of it. It's um, housed at 100 Bay State Row, which is the new Student Service Center. Some of you will have the chance to see that this afternoon with your, your passes. The ERC, as we traditionally call it, ERC, offers peer tutoring. They have a language link, conversation groups, study skills workshops, and a writing center. The writing center is utilized quite extensively by many students. It's really a helpful place for our students as they complete their year of writing. You've heard me talk about our freshman seminar. We have faculty advisors and student advisors through that seminar course that can help identify a problem for a student, recommend tutoring, recommend additional resources. So that's another support. And then, of course, in the undergraduate programs office, we have counselors to help our incoming class and all of our students throughout their four years. You've heard from Jane and Stella, who are freshman counselors. You'll hear from Dan Goncalves, who is another freshman counselor. You'll hear from him this afternoon. And then we have additional counselors to help upper class students as well. And we're really there to help students fine tune their goals, help them know what opportunities exist, help them when they struggle, if they need help in time management or in study skills, and just to give an extra layer of support to students as they pursue a very rigorous degree program. Students may need additional support in the residence halls. Engineering does offer specialty housing. And specialty housing for engineering students is the largest that we have at the university. And the specific places where we offer those housing units are listed in those folders you have. But basically, students need to just designate on their housing interest survey that they want to live in specialty housing. And they're generally able to do that, especially in the first year. Some students decide they do not want to live with other engineers, and that's perfectly acceptable as well. It's really up to a student and their personal choice. I see I skipped engineering tutoring. That was not intentional, but we do have engineering tutoring. And this is a program that we sponsor in the College of Engineering for undergraduates. So it's free for undergraduates to come take advantage of tutoring. Tutors are upper class students in the College of Engineering who are doing well with honors and are very comfortable with the material. So students just show up. It's offered 5 to 11 every night because that's when students are actually studying and 7 to 10 on Sunday nights because we just find we have reduced need on Sunday night. But it's a chance for students to just come and get answers to their questions. They do not have to sign up. They do not have to reserve a time. They literally walk in and a tutor will help them with their coursework. It's a great resource for students. Our Career Development Office offers a bunch of different opportunities as well for our students. They do have um, cooperative education and internship programs available for students who are interested in it. And right now we have more co-op opportunities than we have students who want to pursue them. So it's certainly a viable option for anyone who is interested in pursuing a co-op, but is not a required component in our degree program. Our Career Development Office also offers um, career fairs throughout the year. They do have three different career fairs throughout the course of an academic year where they invite employers to come on campus and talk with our students. To help prepare students for that point in that career fair, we have resume writing workshops and they'll work with students one-on-one -on -one to really help them build that portfolio. We have practice interview sessions so students can kind of get a sense of how they should conduct themselves in that interview. And then, of course, we have the on-campus interview process as well. Boston University has a, an extensive list of student organizations that students can participate in while they are on campus. I tend to recommend students get involved in one engineering group in that first semester and maybe one other group outside of the College of Engineering. 
for some, it's best to wait until the spring semester to add that second group, but for some, they're really ready to go ahead. A lot of our students are coming from high schools where they were involved in a huge array of activities, and it's hard for them to sort of streamline it as they start their freshman year but we want to make sure they have enough time to do their academic work and some are going to need extra time for studying tutoring office hours all of those different resources so we want to make sure the students do get involved but they have four years to get involved it doesn't have to all be added in that first fall semester much to their surprise the College of Engineering has about 25 different groups that students can participate in, and they usually fall within the categories of professional groups, honor societies, or general interest groups. And the specific list of our groups are in your folders, and they're also listed online. Of course, Boston University has an active community service center as well, and students are certainly welcome to participate in any of the programs that we offer through the community service center. Some of those will be volunteer projects, some will be tutoring. There's a large array, so those are some neat chances for students to get involved as well. I want to just show you some of the different resources that we have on campus here today. You're going to see some of these throughout the course of your day, but some of them you will not see. So I thought I'll just go through a couple of them so you get a sense of the buildings and the resources that we do have on campus. This here is the College of Engineering. This is the name of the building. It's where biomedical engineering has many of its labs and its professor's office hours. It's also where undergraduate programs office is down this hallway of student services. And some of you will see that today. That's at 44 Cummington Street. So that's just in the heart of the main part of campus. We've received a large alumni donation recently from Bradford Ingalls to help us create the Ingalls Engineering Resource Center. You will hear this name, Ingalls, as you talk with our students today. And Ingalls is the name of our donor, but it's also called the Engineering Resource Center. Somehow that term got lost with a lot of our students, and it's just called Ingalls. Students use this space to study, to do work, to hang out between classes. It's really become a very popular place for our students to be. You'll see here that there's a picture of a large breakout room. This breakout room seats about 25 students. There's an additional small breakout rooms. These are all different breakout rooms over here. There's seven small breakout rooms that students can use to really help them work on different projects if they so choose. They also can, of course, just work on the laptops. Their laptops, they have the computers there as well. There's projection screens so that they want to work on presentations. They're able to do that. It's just a space for students to congregate to really help them complete their work and work together. Feel free to ask our students today as you talk with them about Ingalls and if they use it. I'm sure you'll hear some who do. <laughs> We've also had another alumni donation for the Singh Imagineering Lab. Uh, Dean Luchin alluded to this a little bit when he talked about the Imagineering Design Competition. This is what the lab looks like. This is probably the, the best sort of one shot angle. These are, of course, different areas of equipment in the lab. But the, this is quite a large space, and some of you will see it today, of course, when you're in the 44 Cummington Street building. As Dean Luchin mentioned, this lab is not associated with any course. So students can't do their homework in this lab. It's really designed as a play station for students to design, to create, to innovate. It's been very busy over the past month as students have been working toward that competition that you heard mentioned, but also as they just have ideas and want to try to get in there before the end of the school year. The Photonic Center is home to a lot of our classes for juniors and seniors as they're studying their engineering work. You see here a picture of a very typical classroom for students. Um, you'll see this space this afternoon for those of you on campus, but just wanted to give you a little preview there. Also, our students who are in mechanical engineering have the, the mechanical engineering building. Here you see a jet engine. It's one of the um, facilities in the wind tunnel that students can utilize who are mechanical engineers or studying courses in mechanical engineering. The life science and engineering building is on Cummington as well, and this building houses bioinformatics, biology, biomedical engineering, and chemistry, and is a great facility for students and has a lot of new labs as well. And then you've heard Dean Luchin mention EPIC, which is the Engineering Product Innovation Center. This is currently being built. We do hope that it will be open. It's scheduled to be open in the fall semester, so students will be able to use that. Your sons and daughters can use it. They'll be the first class to do so. It is a 15,000 square foot facility, as Dean Luchin mentioned. 
The physical layout will comprise flexible teaching space, demonstration areas, labs, and a fabrication facility, all in a reconfigurable layout that will easily be adaptable to future technologies. EPIC will also have an advisory board that will guide them to make sure that the strategy set for the center is current and that the tools and equipment that are needed in the facility are cutting edge. Here you can see an artist rendering of this space. Um, all of that is config reconfigurable, as I mentioned. We're very excited for it to open and anxious to see it beyond just the drawings, but in actual physical space. We would be remiss if we did not take a moment today to talk about what the next steps are if you decide that Boston University is the right school for your son or daughter. A deposit of $650 is required by May 1st for all students who wish to attend the university. After that, students will be invited to register for an orientation session that takes place in the summer. And we also encourage students to complete the online housing interest survey. Housing is done on a first come, first serve basis for incoming freshmen. So if a student really knows exactly where they would like to live, they should fill out that survey early. May is fine, they don't have to do it tonight. Um, May is fine. BU really tries hard to meet the choices that students identify on that housing survey. So if someone lists a school, or a residence hall, excuse me, and they get that survey and they have a very good chance of being able to live in that uh, building. We also encourage students to establish their Boston University email account. That is how we will start beginning our communication with students. We will no longer use their high school or home emails. We'll start using their BU email to get them into the habit of checking that because that's what faculty will use for their classes as well. I want to take a moment to just identify this June 15th deadline as well. This is a College of Engineering deadline, and it's a point where we want students to take the engineering diagnostic exam. The engineering diagnostic exam is an online assessment of algebra and trigonometry. It's one hour. It's not meant to be stressful, but it is meant to help us know where students are with algebra and trigonometry. It's really important that we know that as students begin our program, and if they need additional resources to make sure that those skills are still fresh, then we're able to identify that with students when they come to orientation. We will notify students of this deadline and of the link for the diagnostic exam, both via email, but also we'll send a postcard home just so everybody catches that this is an important time. I just want to draw your attention to it now because June 15th will come pretty quickly, though I do realize a lot will happen in your homes between now and June 15th. <laughs> At this point, I'm going to open up our... Um, forum. Before I do so, actually, I want to remind myself here, we have different contacts. If you need to get in touch with us after today, you certainly may do so. You've heard from Jane. You've seen Stella as well. You'll see Dan this afternoon. If there's anything that you need to know between now and your decision or when your son or daughter starts school, we encourage you to be in touch with us. But now I will open our forum back up for questions. I'm going to invite Dean Eisenberg to return to the stage and Professor DeWinter to return to the stage. And I'm also going to welcome Professor Kathy Claprich. Professor Claprich is a professor in biomedical engineering and mechanical engineering. She's the head of the Claprich Lab for Diagnostics and Global Healthcare Technologies. Her lab focuses on the design and engineering of manufacturable disposable systems for low cost point of care molecular diagnostics. She's also served as an EK100 faculty advisor for our freshmen, and we're glad that she's with us today to help address questions for you. So as the three of them get their microphones settled, what questions do you have? What are things that we have not covered or areas that you would like more information? Yes, right here in the front. So uh, I'm, I need to repeat all of our questions for those watching online. The question is, her son is deciding between Northeastern and Boston University, and she's wondering if we can address those two choices. We'll turn to the dean for that one. <laughs> let me, I need to be careful. Let me jump in here. Can Please do. <laughs> Northeastern is in Boston, and Boston University is in Boston. Is that a good answer? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you, can, you can jump on that now. 
I guess I would ask what, what area? Mechanical engineering. The student is studying mechanical engineering. So I think that, that um, the, the College of Engineering at, at BU um, is a more research active place. Um, be, Northeastern is certainly making inroads in that area. Um, I think of them as being where BU was maybe 15 years ago in terms of its, its institutional transformation from the commuter school that we both were um, to modern you know, research institutions. Um, I think we're further along that developmental path. Um, I'm sure that my colleagues at Northeastern might um, debate that issue with me. <laughs> um, so I don't want to go into too much detail there. Uh, I think the, 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 um, you know, the campus, the city certainly is, is equ equivalent. I like our part of that segment of the city uh, a little bit better, um, but I, I would not say that that's a huge difference. I think the range uh, and the, the peer group um, that our student body compared to the student body there is, is a little bit different as well that goes with the institutional positioning in sort of the, the grand ecosystem of institutions and the students that they draw. Sorry if that's not enough. <laughs> I'd say in general, on questions like that, it has never been our practice to speak negatively of any other university. And I'd say most students don't make their decision based on an analytical comparison of two universities. They feel something sells, tells them this is the right place for them. We have students who are on a tour of 10 universities and halfway through, wherever they are, they say, I don't need to any, see any more, Mom. I know where I want to go. This is the place. So something will tell them that Boston University is the place rather than Northeastern. And I don't, I don't. <laughs> Ted, that is an excellent answer. <laughs> I, I can tell you that I, when I was an undergraduate, I was also deciding between two schools that were very close together and that were very similar. And uh, I had chosen the first one and sent the deposit, and then I went to visit the second one, and I had that feeling that you just described, and um, talked my mother into, um, you know, giving away the 250 or whatever it was I had to had to give the first school. Um, and it really was a feeling, and it ended up being, you know, absolutely the right the right thing in the end. But. Um, yeah. Good to have choices. That's yeah, right. it's good to have mm -hmm. choices. Mm -hmm. Yes? I have the same thing also, Northeastern. Yeah. <laughs> Computer engineering. So can you just go in a little bit more with how your co op works? This question is if we can talk more about our co op program. Uh, are you going to jump on that? I'd say our co op program doesn't work. We have internships. We have very few students currently who do a traditional co-op program, which is one semester in a summer. We prefer to have them just do a summer that does not interfere with their uh, on you know on time graduation, and that gets them every bit that get. We have very few who do that now, and it was more popular some time ago. But that is not a main stay program at Boston University. I'd say our ideal is to have a student have an internship either after their freshman or sophomore year, but importantly after their junior year. And that essentially constitutes a three months interview by the company. And two, uh, two students I recommended last year who did an internship at GE came back with full time offers and they're going to start working at GE next month. And so that is our co op, so to speak, which is internships in the summer. Uh, but we don't have something that uh, essentially prolongs the education beyond the four year. So you have like information to help them find? Oh, yeah, we have we a, career, a career development mm -hmm. office. Yep. Yep. There are four professionals there that are tasked with uh, working with undergraduates. As the Luchin mentioned, you know, starting in the freshman year, although we're, how they work with them and, and the degree to which they work with them varies as, as students move through in a developmentally appropriate way. Yes, over here. The question is about advanced placement credits and if we advise students to utilize those credits or if we think it's an advantage to not use them as they're adjusting to campus. 
I'll mention that Boston University generally takes fours or fives on advanced placement exams. Um, we don't take threes, but we do take fours or fives. When it gets to whether or not we encourage students to utilize those credits, I say we have to break it down by topic. Um, we're very, very careful about calculus, and if a student knows the information in calculus, then we certainly are willing to let them proceed to the next level, but we're less concerned of what the actual four or five score was. We want to make sure you know what you're doing in calculus. So over orientation, we will give students a list of topics in calculus and what's covered in our courses, and we'll talk with them about their comfort in those different topic areas. Um, that's one example, but in the areas that are really fundamental to engineering, we're cautious, but if students feel that they have a very good grasp of the information, we don't require them to repeat the course and they can utilize the credits. Anyone else want to chime conceptual, in? You know, their, their conceptual understanding of the material is really critical and not well tested on an AP exam. We've seen kids with very high scores that have, can, you know, can turn the crank, do the work, but do not understand mm -hmm. really what calculus is about, and that becomes a, a real obstacle for them as they move through the rest of the curriculum. As you know, the, the, the calculus sequence is an enabling. Um, we use higher level math all the time in engineering, and even if the computers do much of the work, if you can't conceptualize what's being done, uh, it's then it's magic and, and you're not going to be able to do that. So we actually will have conversations with students um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis about the decision to take the credit or not take the credit in a subject-by-subject -subject way. It's very, very individualized. Yes, in the back. question is about the degree difference between Boston University and a technical degree like WPI or RPI. So I think I'll, I'll start. The, the, I, I think it goes back to one of Dean Luchin's early slides where he was setting out what the societal engineer philosophy is. So all of the engineering schools in the United States teach students to be good engineers. They teach the fundamentals, they teach advanced topics. I think that it's the extra stuff, it's the, it's the contextual things that will differ significantly uh, on a campus like BU um, from a technical school campus. The, the existence, the fact that we as a college of engineering represent about 9% of the population on this campus means that most of the people that, that engineers interact with on this campus are not necessarily only engineers. And that is, is an enriching experience, the opportunity to do uh, course, take coursework from a variety of units um, where their bread and butter is not engineering, I think is, is again, a mind, a, an expansive opportunity for students uh, that choose to do that. And I think those are differentiators um, in between what a student experience here will be. I don't think it will be one that is technically better or worse from those two places. It's all of the other stuff, the opportunities that we enjoy because of a, a robust study abroad office here. We send the university sends 2,500 students abroad. That's why I was able to run these little programs that, that are spending, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 students abroad in engineering. That's pretty unusual. I think we sent about 20% of our students in engineering abroad last year. Um, and that, if you look around the country, is not the norm. Norms are like in the 3 to 4 or 5%. So those are examples of things that we can do because of the extensive nature of the university, <coughs> Boston University, uh, compared to technical schools. Can't, can't, can't underestimate the um, just the um, the vibrancy of, of a large um, community that has not that that has many different professional schools and and also you know all the all the different um, liberal arts and fine arts uh, disciplines around you know there's always a performance or a show or um, cross disciplinary um, seminars and you know just all around us all, all the time. 
Um, and you know, at, at a school that's focused primarily on engineering, even those that are very good, that are very nearby, um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have um, that kind of breadth of experience. And I, I see that as being a huge um, benefit for our students when they come toward the end of their, um, of their undergraduate career because a lot of our students don't go work as entry-level engineers. They go to law school, they go to medical school, they go to business school, um, or they, they go into uh, a profession after um, a bridge year in, 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 a, in a complementary um, area of research. We have a lot of students um, now who are very interested in global, global health and, and, and energy, for instance, and, and those folks will you know, be able to see that from our point of view, the engineering point of view, how you make things, how you do things, what the math is, how you calculate efficiencies and so forth, but then they can also partake in things like um, the Pardee Center, for instance, will have seminars on you know, how, how do new energy um, technologies impact society. Um, and that, that's all here, and you'll see it advertised in, in the hallway in, in the College of Engineering. Um, and, and the students do, do interact in those ways, especially near the end when they're starting to really think about careers and how to integrate themselves into, into interesting careers that'll satisfy them for more than just you know, the first five years out. All three of the university or, university or schools you mentioned are ABET accredited, which is the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. Ultimately, what you get out of an engineering program is what you put into it, I'd say, if you want to compare Troy, New York, or Worcester, Massachusetts with Boston, <laughs> good luck to you. Uh, but the other thing is, I think that if you go to WPI or RPI, uh, you find a much higher nerd index than we have at Boston University. Uh, that doesn't even compare with MIT. And uh, when I went to MIT, I had been in college for four years, and I was somewhat introverted. And I got to MIT and I looked around and I said, these people are socially dysfunctional. <laughs> and, and overnight I became an extrovert. So I think we are much more normal people to university. We'll than, move on. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another question? <laughs> yes, in the back. The question is about class size, if we can give a range of what the class sizes are and who teaches our classes. Go ahead. I currently have four courses this semester. One of them had 31 students in the first section, that's a module, 24 in the second. I've got another course with 54 students, one with 61 and one with 25. That's about the average and no one has ever taught one of my lectures but and that's, that's typical. That's Graduate typical. students don't teach at Boston University in general. They will assist. They will do discussions and assist in a mentored way. But professors, not all full professors, there are assistant, associate, and full, um, but professors uh, teach the courses. And that's universal within the institution. It's not just the College of Engineering. Within that first semester, the, the grid that I showed, students will take calculus, which will vary a little bit by time. If they want a smaller section, the 8, eight o'clock is wide <laughs> open. Um, the 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock sessions will have more students in it, and that might be 80 students in it, where the 8 o'clock might be more like 40. Um, engineering computation is going to have 33 students with a discussion session associated with it that is smaller. Writing will be 18. It's maxed at 18. Um, and then the introduction to engineering modules do range based on interest. They generally, seats are about anywhere from 15 to 35. Professor DeWinter actually teaches the largest one because his is the most popular. <laughs> but then it just varies. And as students get into their junior, senior courses, the sizes, you know, they change. But as you heard him talk about, the classes can vary in terms of size themselves as juniors and seniors. We do not have lectures of juniors and seniors for 200, 300 students. Yes, here in the front. I'd like to ask about the uh, freshman seminar and the fact that uh, while my daughter knows that she wants to go into engineering, she's not certain what she wants her major to be, potentially biomedical, potentially mechanical with a uh, minor in materials. I noticed that second semester, uh, BME students would be taking Chem 2. 
Uh, so it really sounds like she's going to have to make a decision by then, um, potentially uh, for uh, materials as well. Does the freshman seminar actually address that? Does it focus the students on what they want to do? So the question is that students have to, students who are biomedical engineers have to decide if they want a second semester of chemistry in that first year. Does our freshman advising seminar help students with the choice of major and help them figure that out? Is that a good paraphrase? Okay. Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, generally, we do encourage students who are considering biomedical engineering to take the chemistry that they may need for biomedical engineering, and the other disciplines actually count it as other components as a natural science elective later in the curriculum. So you don't really lose time if you take that chemistry. It, it just sort of flips down later in the program. But with that said, the main point, one of the main points of the freshman advising seminar is to expose students to what the degrees are that we offer. And so students will be placed in, they can be placed in a biomedical group with a biomedical faculty member and biomedical engineering junior or senior student advisor, or they can be in an undecided group where the faculty and student advisor know these students don't know yet what they want. And so we encourage active conversation about what the different disciplines are, what areas they like, kind of talking it out a little bit. Students tend to do that with our student advisors. That peer-to-peer -peer interaction seems to be really important. I could say the same thing, and somehow it doesn't have the same credence as if a junior who's living it says that same information. So we think that student advisor interaction is really pivotal for students understanding that. And our student advisors go through a pretty extensive training. So if a student says, well, I have a, a freshman in my group who's biomed, but I'm electrical, let me get, connect that freshman with one of my biomed peers so they can have that conversation too. So we try to really make sure that students have resources to ask questions, talk about these things. Anything else? The, uh, just so you know, your daughter is not alone. Yeah, about not the alone. 25 to 30 percent of the incoming students will be undecided officially, although they may have in their minds somewhere to go. And I can also say that of those that are certain that they want to do whatever it is they have, have subscribed or written down from biomed, mechanical, electrical, or computer, um, a fair number of those will change at least once, and sometimes more frequently, um, over the course of their time at BU. So this uncertainty, we understand that they are still high school students and that they really are not sure where they're going to be and what those trajectories are going to be. And they have good reason not to be because there really is not a whole lot of information that, that they've been exposed to and that's available to them. And we try to fill those gaps. I, I can't promise that it's a perfect filling um, and that it all happens just in time. Um, but w you know, we do get most of our students uh, where they need to be uh, and out the door in the four years that we uh, that you're expecting them to be. Most students tell me that they have a really good sense by the fall of their sophomore year and then they still have that spring semester to really confirm and solidify that choice. But certainly ask our students as you are around campus today and ask them their opinions as well and how they chose their major. Okay, we have time for I think about one more question on the far side. Okay, the question is about our engineering modular medical program, the com combined program with biomedical engineering and the medical school. So I'll be brief. That's a, it, it, it's an early selection program. It's very, very selective. We're not talking about a large number of students. You can count them uh, in any given year on less than the fingers of one hand. Um, the number of applicants, there's a lot of self-selection and advising that goes on as to whether an applicant might or might not be competitive. Um, so we don't have a large number of applicants either to the program. It works well for those that it, it, it's a good fit for, and I think we're reasonably good at, at figuring those things out. The program's been around for quite some time, and uh, we, we expect it to continue. They don't get through their undergraduate or through medical school any faster. Um, the whole issue of even advanced standing has been uh, de-emphasized in this program. It's really about knowing where they're going and being able to get off of the, uh, what I think of as the pre-med treadmill um, of doing things that may not make a whole lot of sense just because they need to do them to please somebody else. Um, they've already done that, they're on a track and they can do what makes sense to advance their interests in their career. 
Thank you. I'm going to end our session now because we do need to continue with our program for the day. For those of you who have been watching us online, we do thank you for joining us and we hope this has been an informative session. For everyone on campus, we hope you will still continue with us throughout the day.